my people wonder shall never end like since i was born this is the worst the most corrupt government i have ever seen like not just because they are not performing they are full of lies propaganda deceit like everything bad is full with this Tinubu administration my people look at this headline other state government becomes third nigeria state to die receiving Tinubu's 20 trucks of rice <laughs> so now it's only apc state that are giving these 20 trucks of rice please nigerians if you have received any rice from your state government local government wherever because of this hardship please can you comment in the comment section so that we'll know because all this news flying up and down that Tunubu, you know gave each state 20 trucks of rice ah my people this is so sad honestly not only that too in that Tunubu protest speech he claimed that he gave all the states in nigeria 570 billion naira in order to you know manage this hardship and hunger my people hey <laughs> hey like more states they are coming out to say they have not even received any money from nigeria government look at it like this is the most propaganda government i have ever seen not only that too, after the first uh, speech nubu made so there is another video that came out which they posted in tunubu's uh, twitter account but at the end of the day Bayer Onoga came out and said that that video is a fake then who posted it in tunubu's twitter account my people these people they are confused they don't even know what they are doing and this is the result of what is happening look at nigerians nigerians are suffering because of all the nonsense decisions they are making there because these people they don't even know left and right they don't even know where they are going or where they are coming from like they are all confused how can a president come out on national television with this kind of lies this is so so terrible let me allow you guys to listen to dr sam amadi this man really said it as it is here my people concerning the 20 trucks of rice tunubu said that he distributed to the all the states in nigeria as well as the money he said that some governors are not coming out to say that they have not received any money from federal government chai this is so terrible my people just take a look all right uh, i'm sure that you've been following the uh brick bat between uh, the federal government and the state government uh and of course it all stemmed uh, from uh, the speech, uh, the, the, the statewide, uh, uh, nationwide address by President Bola Tinubu uh, in the course of the protest, the 10-day protest, uh, whereby said that part of what his administration has done uh, is to disburse a total of about 573 billion naira to state governments. And that, uh, you know, uh, people should also find a way uh, to make their states accountable in all this noise uh, regarding uh, hunger, regarding hardship, uh, etc. But of course, as you know, uh, Governor Shea Makide of Oyo State was the first to come out to say that nothing of the sort happened. Uh, Lassarawa has joined, Osho State has joined, Abia State, you know, all claiming that uh, federal government didn't uh, dish out any grant to them, that what they got uh, was part of the NG CARES uh, uh, intervention which was a World Bank assisted, uh, assisted uh, loan that states will be required to repay as part of the uh, monetary, you know, uh, to take care of, uh, uh, of their needs, certain part of their need uh, because of COVID-19. Where is the truth, Dr. Amadi? Was the president misled in his uh, address or are we just simply playing politics again? Well, thank you very much for having me. Again, I think there are three issues I would like to uh, focus on here. First is that uh, we don't expect uh, a high presidential speech of such uh, critical importance uh, addressing the nation um, as a way of uh, ending uh, national protests that uh, we will have basic facts of presidential action being disputed. So it, it will now have what looks like a presidential lie, and that's not a good moment for you know the president to lie. Not just about recollection of facts. Uh, I was in Oyo, or I was in Owere on 12th of September. Well, it didn't go there. That's that's those are minor, or maybe um, an expression of opinion or self-description for purpose of political uh, capital 
that didn't try to be true. Uh, that, is, that speaks to the, to the president's maybe uh, honesty. But this is about intervention, huge intervention, that the president claimed to have made as part of addressing the hunger and the challenges that you know, um, provoked this national protest. So to have it in the presidential speak, uh, speech speaks to a mindset of, one can say, fraud. I mean, the, whether the presidential speech writer themselves, who embedded that fact and you know, shaped it to be like, look, Mr. President has actually been responding to these concerns by advancing this amount of money for states to deal with the outcome of these policies we are making. So in a sense, the president kind of uh, uh, rebuts the presumption against him that I say, look, this is evidence. I, I've been doing what you tell me to do. And again, push back to the states. The states have failed to, to deliver these uh, palliatives. If they have done so, maybe the, the, the hunger question would have been less and the problem would not. No. So it's, it's like being a court and adducing false evidence to prove your innocence. So in the public court, the president brought what's now turned out to be false claim to make a case. Uh, so it damages the case made, but it speaks more to the, the temper and the, the morality of the people behind the, the presidency in terms of how desperate and what degree of falsehood they can marshal to exonerate themselves. Again, it's like the president is also kind of, you know, you know, putting the state governors at risk. So, I mean, if state governors really received this amount of money for intervention to deal with hunger, which is not uh, project-based money, then the question is, why didn't they, you know, distribute it? Why, why didn't we see the impact? So, in other words, the principal minders push the, kick the can, say, guys, you are, you are facing the wrong guy. This guy has done everything he could do. Look at the state governors. They're the ones who cause this problem. They're the ones whose failure of governance results in what we are f facing today. And so if that was true, then the president has made a case why we should now, you know, pivot to the state governors as the villains in this case. Right, so the okay. governors are right to, right. you know, right. mildly fight back. Right. So, so for me, it was an error. It was a tactical you know, defense. Go, go ahead, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Sam Amade, I'm, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you here because, you know, you've used uh, two very strong words to describe what the president had said. You know, you said it, you know, appears to be a presidential lie and even fraud. Mm -hmm. But the federal government, through the Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning, had mm -hmm. put out an ad on July 22nd, to be specific, on this day newspaper announcing the reimbursement of 438 billion naira of this World Bank intervention loan to 34 states and the FCT. That's with the exception of Anambra and Kaduna. I have that um, ad right in front of me. On, and they say it's under a COVID-19 recovery plan, NG Cares. Um, you know, it's a program for results whereby states had to use their money to advance um, to, and to implement the program. Uh, they said the loan was given to states after the World Bank had verified the amount spent by each state and that the purpose of that loan was to help each state expand access to livelihood support of their citizen, that is also to assist in food security services and grants, pay attention, grants to poor and vulnerable households. The president, um, you know, in, her, in his speech had said that more than 570, this is what he said, and I quote, more than 570 billion has been released to 36 states to expand livelihood support to their citizens. That's all he said in that statement. That's what he said. And, you know, he, now he says it's 36 states. In that ad, I saw 34 states, and it was, you know, a little lower than 570. It was 438. So we're assuming that maybe the other two states left out has been included. That's yet to be fact-checked. And you're hearing all your state governor, Shay Makinde, saying that, yeah. you know, his mm -hmm. announcement was a misrepresentation of facts because the states are only being reimbursed funds that they have already invested. Now, how is it misrepresentation when the federal government itself actually had announced sure. the same intervention, explaining exactly what Shay Makinde had said? How is this misrepresentation? So let me answer you very quickly. I mean, I, I think... It's good to brought the facts. It actually refers to my position. Now look at it. A reimbursement presupposes a spend. So the state are being reimbursed. 
Many of those states, of course, the way government works sometimes, you know, loans and debts and all that. Okay, fine. Now, that's an advert for a program or a, a publication for a program which the World Bank, you know, paid states. So states have an entitlement. It's the the federal government, program. look at how it works. The federal the presidency program. as the so. It's the yeah. same exact program. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it's a state program. Yeah. No, no, the point I'm making is that that's not the presidential speech. The content of the presidential speech is a reflection of what government has done to deal with the outcome of the policies they are challenging. So that's why I use the word very carefully. I said, if that speech, you're not, there are many programs government, state governors have gotten loans for different things. And by the way, nobody should take the state government from responsibility because exactly. governance is subnational in the main. The point I'm making is that in a presidential speech where you pass off, passing off, the pass off here was that in response to all these things, this is what we've done. We've done, not what the World Bank has done or what they said entitled to. The federal government do give reforms, and you know, because they are like the point I'm making that the federal government is the gateway to the states. Under constitutional law, the sole organ is the president. So even if the states have legitimate entitlement from international organizations or foreign bodies, they pass to the federal government. Now, back to today's issue, the question then is it seems to me, and this could be debatable that it was passed off as one of the things that the federal government has done in its program of, the federal government has announced after the removal of fuel subsidy, series of programs, interventions to deal with the crisis of hunger and the crisis of uh, loss of livelihood that accompanied those policies. So it was pushed as if this is something the, the, the states have received from the federal government as federal government program. Now there are two, two different things. The federal government, develops programs which they mandate states to implement. And I think we'll get to that. Those programs are guided by policy and law, and they create entitlement for citizens. And you presage them with announcement. So citizens know that this is federal program, being administered by state or local government, or even by private or non-profits. Those are federal programs. A World Bank reimbursement to states is an entitlement of the states presupposing that the states have made investment or borrowed to deliver projects which the World Bank considers important and embossing them. So the point I'm making is that when I use the word potential lie, it doesn't necessarily mean that they cooked up figures. It, it means that you've passed off this as part of what you have done. And again, the bigger question here is, why should we you know, tie, yes, the, the World Bank loan or World Bank support is part of a socioeconomic intervention in a global sense. But the real question here, and I think that's what the principle should be addressing. So first, it's not a lie that the state governor says, you didn't give us money for anything. You gave us back our reform from the World Bank. So that is settled, that what the federal government gave was a reform, not a federal project to intervene, even though the impact could be the same. So this is important for principal communication. Because for me, the context of the principal speech, which we have all criticized, is that it was supposed to be a response to the demands of the protesters, and it came across as this is just what we have done in response to what they did. But it not came out to be this is actually funds that we have advanced on behalf of the World Bank to states who are entitled to. So I think for me, yes, the word lie does not mean that. Like I said, it's not like a fact. It's like going to court and proving your innocence by contextualizing transactions that are not fit for that transaction. So you can take an event that happened in a different context and present it as if this is a, something that, and that's what the states are responding. I mean, if the federal government has said, well, we have advanced to the state the World Bank loan, which the World Bank guaranteed to them, we've done that, the states will not come back and say, no, you didn't give us money. Everybody saw this as money that should have been used within this period as part of federal federalized intervention to do with the, 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 the outcome of the policies, mm -hmm. and it is not. And right. that's the context in which I say yeah. they have now put the states at risk of, mm -hmm. of attack. Yeah, that's yes. the point. I mean, yeah, you are, you are, you are spot on, Dr. Sabamadi, with that. You know, passing it off as if it is their, you know, uh, grant. Because the governor of Nasara State, like um, Steve had highlighted, last week said that, you know, the World Bank loan was for infrastructural projects and not for palliatives, and that the loan was an interest-free loan initiated back in 2020. Therefore, the loan predates the Tinubu administration. In fact, the first loan disbursement Absolutely. was done even before Tinubu became president in May 2023. But, you know, when you look at the reimbursement Absolutely. announcement, um, you know, this uh, back in July, the Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning gave that impression that you are saying. They, they said that the program was made possible 
because of the various policy reforms introduced by President Tinubu, which enabled states to invest heavily in the program. In fact, the ministry said, and let me quote here, that NG Cares is one of the social protection programs that are implementing the tenets of the Renewed Hope Agenda. I mean, this is, this is the question a lot of people are asking. Why, why would you make such a, 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 a statement, this semantics to deceive Nigerians? That's the question. Absolutely. I, th I think the answer to that question is, look, you govern according to your social psychology. This government really is a strong government on politics and propaganda. Propaganda, quote unquote, it doesn't mean falsehood. But it means that there is a, you, know, you, you, you use communication to solve technical and managerial problems. You, if you're not driving your policy well, or oh, everything is under the mantra of renewed hope. So you see talking points around re renewed hope, renewed hope. And so this deception is a product of that mental fixation around propagandizing. Look, you don't need to do that. This is not part of any renewed hope intervention. This is something that predates your government. And so go go governance runs, some of the bureaucratic things are not politically visible. They are part of transactions for years. And so government run them as routine administrative work. But then you have to speak to what you are doing in terms of policy. So it seems to me that the inability to really first inability to create policies that are transformative and inability to explain these policies in the sense, in the, in the way that they show how government is transforming is the pro reason why there's so much fallback to propaganda, to misspeak. And then you see also that sometimes presidential communications are contradictory. Somebody will say, oh, uh, we've got visa waiver from Dubai. Somebody will say, oh, it's not actually visa waiver, it was this. I think they should you know, pause and say, look, let's get back to basics of governance. Let's look at the rule and say, oh, if you don't have the skill set, we bring the skill set, we develop policy. That, uh, they, they probably have good intention, the intuition of what, how to drive the economy. But then you need to get these policies well and then communicate them well and also tell the people that, look, people understand that there will be no massive transformation they want. But they want to see rationality in policy design. They want to see a commitment, a honesty and sincerity in driving them, and want also to see some short wins that kind of post signal the long term gain they're going to get. We're not getting the distance. So each time you try to, if you do a, a communication audit of the government, of governance structures, since you know, the political came to power, you, you see a lot of these misrepresentations and mischaracterization because of these over, overwhelming each, each, each to get into the Propaganda war to 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 to, to kind of uh, uh, you know blind spot people to kind of stop every any wave of criticism to you know frightened by criticism. That's not how to govern. Be calm. Explain what you are doing. Don't have this instinct to go and say what you are not doing and then confuse yourself and then lie because when the moment government begins to lie, it loses the credibility. I mean, why should we believe presidential communication if we see that they are actually lying needlessly? You don't need to do that. So, so I think that failure to, to, to understand or to create policies that you know, give confidence of government approach to governance and then ability to explain what you're doing in a way that people see, oh, this is the roadmap. And we, even though we're not happy with the outcome, but we can see you know, some, we can keep faith with that process. That inability is what is pushing them further down the path of propaganda, you know, um, you know, miscommunication, and then being much more combative in trying to then prove we're running the government well, and then you keep on making that mistake. So I, I think it's, it's a social psychology because it's about how you approach, define your governance. And maybe too much politics too early creates that, because these are the kind of things you see on soapbox you know, campaigns. Um, people lie a lot, whether in the US, anywhere in the world, have truths, you know, have big truths, misrepresentations, just to create the optics and create the narrative that you want to sell to voters. But after election in governance, you, know, you, you, you should sit back and know that, look, the, the projects, outcomes, results will penalize you in the short to medium term. I, I don't know what happens with the election, that's a different issue, but for governance, they're not getting it right, and that's the problem I see.
Yes, thank you, Dr. Um, Samamadi. Now, I, I actually have a question along the line of what you're saying, um, because we're talking about semantics, we're talking about propaganda, but I think like um, the framing by the federal government, do you think this is frightening? Do you think that they possibly do not understand the difference between a loan and a grant? Or that they do not believe the Nigerian public will understand the difference between a loan and a grant? Because by, you know, putting out the image that the governors are receiving endless billions of nairas um, as though it were a grant which is not tied to particular, or as though it were a grant instead of loan, which loans are tied to particular programs, loans have to be repayable. They might have to be repayable with interest, that this is World Bank mandated. And so if this is money that has to be repayable, it would not be, for example, uh, proper to use it for a, a program that we've seen from the federal government, for example, sharing of rice, because how do you get the money back if you just buy bags of rice and put it on a truck? So do you believe that the federal government is intentionally misleading the Nigerian public by obscuring whether we have a loan or a grant and what that means for the government and what that means for the people? Because any loan taken now or any loan used now will have to be paid in the future by Nigerians. Well, first, I don't know the due process mechanism of cross-checking presidential speak, uh, speeches. So I don't know, you know, it depends on who writes them and the level of sensitivity to error. One of the things, honestly, I can say is that both in terms of hiring, in terms of mistakes, in terms of nullifying, for example, the president first rolled out um, um, uh, board, of, board members of teacher institutions in Nigeria. After a day or two, they rolled back. So I've seen a lot of uh, errors that tells me that um, that tell me that maybe there's not too much uh, safeguards in terms of, uh, you know, or so much commitment to factual, you know, f f factuality in some of the presidential communication, whether uh, presidential speech or other formal communication. So that might be that uh, people really don't care. In the, in, in the heat of, ca of, of, of campaign, protests, of you got to do something, you have to crowd in too many things we are doing. And so that tendency, I've seen it. So it might be that somebody probably just, 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 bring, the, just bring those facts, bring everything to show overwhelming evidence that we are working. Uh, and so that could be the pro problem. I, I don't think that um, anybody in the bureaucracy of government will not know the difference between a grant, a loan, and other you know, government if, uh, interventions, schemes of uh, financial schemes to address, address problems. They, they should be able to know. Again, it also depends on something like I was in government for five years. Uh, in the executive branch, I was in legislative, and I've been in, as a minister, uh, advisor for foreign affairs. One thing I say in government, sometimes, it depends on how government is c constructed, you see a disconnection between the bureaucracy of government, that means the staffers, permanent staffers, the, the, the technocrats in the presidency, in the SGS office, and, and the political operatives who are the president. If you don't see that connection, if they don't have respect for that you know, work of technocrats who we call civil servants, you see that maybe they won't even understand these basics and they miss out on important narratives and important nuances that matter for governance. And so it might seem to me, part of the problem might be how the White House, uh, sorry, State House is constructed in terms of engagement and linkages with um, the, this type of staff and the political aids that come with the president, largely from Lagos State. Now, there's a historical example. I, when I left the uh, Buhari government at the early time, when they, my tenure finished as next chairman, one of the special guys called me and said, look, they discovered that under Jonathan, they had, when they go to NEC, FEC, or whatever they call FEC, they see that the memos prepared by civil servants were stronger than the ones they are using. So they now went back to civil servants. That's interesting, because I think that how you create that place called the villa, can be the answer, the, can determine whether the government succeeds. So I think probably there should be much more focus on procedure, on competence, on, on process. Uh, you know, the chief of staff probably should rethink how that place is staffed because these errors is self-inflicting self harm because if it's strategic, then it's failing. If it is not strategic, then it shows gross uh, incompetence and uh, lack of rigor in, 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 in pressure communication, whether speech or documentation. So I, I think it's, I would say they don't know, but probably they, 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 are, they are kind of the overexcitement, the anxiety, it's anxiety of, you know, crowding in all data, overwhelming public communication with evidence that now turns out to not be true. 
and that's tragic. Or it seems that maybe the guys who are driving the show are not in touch with the guys who know or who ought to know. So either way, it's, it's a crisis for governance and probably uh, would never lead to effectiveness in terms of governance. You see, policies have effectiveness, and that's in the new area of development studies. People are wondering, it doesn't have to say policy. Effectiveness goes to the bureaucracy, goes to the quality and the processes, the coordinations and the coherence in which the political actors are in touch with the bureaucratic, technocratic actors that provide much more you know, institutional uh, competence to, to, to deliver on projects or deliver on programs or whatever, or even communication. So, so far, uh, they're not doing very well. So it might be this gap, it might be some kind of inability, it might be too much anxiety to get into the communication space and crowd out, you know, dissent. I think every government shouldn't be paralyzed by criticism. You should sit back, analyze what they're saying, and even if you don't have evidence to adduce, you could make a communication, a commitment that this is how you're going to go. Don't just go and bring any kind of evidence, even in the, in the, short, in the long term, that evidence hurts you. That's not the way I think we should go. Thank you. I just want to quickly follow up because, <clears throat> you know, you've talked about maybe the chief of staff or how ASAROC is run, but it's been 14 months since um, President Bola Tinubu has joined office and we've only gotten pre-recorded speeches from him. Do you believe that these issues would be cleared up if he just sat down with journalists and allowed them to ask questions and answer them directly? <laughs> You know, the strategic management of the president is an issue. I mean, if you go to the U.S. or elsewhere, you see, sometimes say, oh, uh, oh, oh, this president or this candidate is not talking to the media direct. Uh, it, it, it destroys trust. But then the question is, is it that uh, the president cannot do that? The president comes across to me as somebody who is articulate, uh, who has a fusky way of dealing with people, who has humor. So I don't understand why he can't grant interviews. So yeah, that's probably what you don't know. But on appearance, I think he's stable enough, he's smart, he's able to engage with one-on-one. -on -one. So I think that the, maybe uh, the managers are not properly estimating the, the damage uh, of not having the president speak to Nigerians, particularly prepared, and not just prepared, but record a speech. I mean, the, 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 the most dramatic is the president reading his speech and people on social media reading the text with him line by line. We know that media always gets advanced a copy, but uh, the fact that it went viral and uh, now, you know, caricature of the speech is it was terrible. So I, I think that they need to rethink the strategy of shielding him from real interviews, you know, with journalists real time. I mean, Jonathan, with all the everything said against him, very tried a couple of you know, those kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I think the president, in my view, has what it takes to withstand 30 minutes, 60 minutes of... of and Nigerian journalists have, are not that very, you know, offensive or aggressive. They, they, they should do respect to potentate. So I would assume that whatever interview is going to be would be with, uh, you know, arranged or scrutinized, profiled journalists, and everybody in the room would behave like adults. So, I don't see the reason why the print is not addressing the media. And a time of crisis, by the way, development requires mobilization. It, it, it has to be around nationalism. And there's no way you can, the president says, he told the patriots, say, I'm focused on economic development. And that's a good thing to say. But they can't do economic development in such a disarticulated economy like ours if you're not able to use the bully pulpit, pressure speech, to mobilize citizens. And you don't do that with this prepared error reading text. You, just have to do it, engaging the people, and finding a way to inspire confidence and trust in you. So I, I think it's a high time he brings back, you know, those uh, media chat. I mean, we used to have the you know, fortnightly media chat. It's good. It shows the printers are aware. It, it connects with the people. It creates an optics of an attentive presence. So the notion that the president will be away for one week or, you know, we, we don't hear from him under national emergency, and then he comes in to read a televised, a, document, a videoed speech and retreats back to Corsica by personages. It's not the idea mm. of effective leadership in a traumatized, complex and difficult time like we are now. All right. Uh, Dr. Mark, the, uh, very uh, two quick questions uh, before we let you go. Uh, first will be that, is it possible to excuse all of this to his first one year in office, uh, given the fact that uh, this is the first time that Ashwaju himself uh, will be functioning 
uh, uh, at a federal executive capacity, you know, outside of Lagos. And don't forget the fact that, you know, he left being governor uh, since 2007. Um, I, I, I followed, you know, deeply what you have said. Uh, reminds me, you know, by the way, of what um, uh, 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 some of, you know, even Ashwaju supporters are saying these days about the team around him and, and why tweaking them might be necessary. I'm sure that you listened to one of <laughs> his uh, vociferous supporters, Jesu Tega uh, Onopasa, you know, who said that, you know, uh, spoke about the chief of staff, spoke about other people, you know, we don't know how fair his assessment might be. Uh, do you think that this can be excused on his first year and what specifically uh, are the areas where you think uh, it can tweak things going forward? And then very quickly, secondly, will be what are your thoughts around uh, this deflection that is that, that now permits, you know, uh, uh, the information machinery of the government, you know, uh, uh, whereby they are just saying, "Oh, ask your governor, ask your governor." They are getting more money. I, I, I'm forgetting that uh, with the sharing formula uh, on a monthly, yearly basis, the federal government still gets 52.68 percent uh, of 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 um, you know the sharing. Uh, states get 26.72 percent. And local government 20.60. Uh, 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 if you add the state and local government together, it's barely 46%. So federal government still get a greater share of um, uh, uh, of all the money that they're sharing. But what we're hearing these days is that whole states are getting more money. Go and ask your governors. But federal government is also getting more money. Do you think that this will hurt this administration, this line of thought, ultimately, deflecting responsibility you know, to states and to local government? Let me start with the last. I think it will hurt them because the, the public perception of government in Nigeria is federalized. So when government doesn't work, people look at the federal government. I understand and I, I think it's true that the states have to do more and we need to localize uh, struggle for democracy, struggle for development at the state. That makes perfect sense. And again, um, the, 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 the recovery part for Nigerian economy should come from the states, local government state. In fact, without local economy and state level economic growth, you probably will not have a sustainable federal or national economic growth. So that's a key point. But again, the federal government has to be clear in its mind. It creates the impression that the federal and states are the same people. So every, every time they're inviting them to villa, they're coming to the president, they say, oh, we support the president. You know, so they not you can't eat a cake and have it. If you create the impression that this is a presidential, you know, uh, uh, this is a, a elected kingship, the president is a king over the whole country, then you can't come and say, well, go to your state. You created the impression. So everybody's looking to the federal government. You federalize attention politics. The states are announcing as surrogates of the president each time they're the villa. Um, you know, tell them to go back to their states. I ask them to disappear. Do your work. Let me do my work. So. The presidential psychology also will help to create that state level accountability. So the, everybody knows that the state governors, look, you are in charge of this area. Again, even in much more uh, clearly federal states like the US, uh, Switzerland, everywhere else, the, the, the definition of federal interventions are well created. You think around the so-called National um, Southeast Development Commission, Northeast, uh, Northeast and all those human commissions. The president does not have the constitutional power to appoint subnational officials to use subnational funds. So when you create a, a state uh, level or a regional level development commission and the president appoints the officers, as the, as, the, as the act says, and they are using part of allocations that are constitutionally you know, uh, allocated to the states to run those entities, that's a constitutional infringement. Because in other words, there's no constitutional power of the president to appropriate state level resources, to, to dictate state level projects. The federal power ends on those exclusive lists where the president can federalize in the state. So you can see this constitutional you know, you know, confusion. And so when you now federalize everything and create development interventions for the regions and take their money, allocations going to them, 13% should go to this development agency, which, which you appoint, which is also makes it a federal agency, then that's a constitutional violation. And so you can't sit back and say, go to the state. So the point I make is that the, the, the president, to make that communication coherent, you need to pull back from federalizing and be clear 
that the state governors should stay in their lane and don't coerce them and co corral them to drive their own particular agenda. Let them be on their lane. And so when you talk at party level, it's at party level, but at governance, clear that clarity. The second point, and I think so it will hurt them because except they intervene and shape how states deliver. Politically, governors should be safe if there's a collapse of the economy and the president will be the one who is damned. So if I was a president, I would either say, don't come here, stay in your lane, or I would intervene to shape through presidential power of persuasion, sometimes of coercion, you know, indirect, to force them to use the resources they have to drive development. So the president can become, we call it the bully puppet, can communicate, can shape policy, can nudge state actors towards strategic behavior that will add back to the national economic growth. So if you create a federal, a federal system and the states are basically not pulling their weight and the federal government is there, the federal government will suffer because at the end of the day, yeah, there's a national economy and when people are suffering in Zamfara, they're going to talk about the federal government more than they talk about the Zamfara government. It's unfortunate, but that's how it is. So yeah. I think they will lose, they need to shape up the communication. And then back to the issue you raised around quickly on the... Um, um, what's that point again? This is the first question around. Uh, I think around, around, the, around the, uh, um, I think the that can he be excused on the first one year of Ashiwaju and what can he oh, quickly sure, sure, sure. tweak? I yeah. get it. Yeah. Yes. Very quickly. Yeah, I get that very clearly. Look, right. look. The problem. Yeah, quickly. I think the so-called Lagos phenomenon is a problem. Again, first, you made a good point. Ashiwaju, smart guy, when he was governor. Many years have passed, he has not held any executive position, he has been doing politics, politics, politics. He packs himself around himself, guys who 20 years ago or 16 years ago stopped doing any other thing. So they were commissioners, they'd never managed or become executives in other institutions and suddenly they are driving policy. That's a failure recipe. You have to update and see the Nigerian space as their space. The APC made a mistake in 2015 when they came, and I had to tell then the uh, managers of the VP. I said, look, the federal government belongs to you. The, the federal state belongs to you. Stop doing, oh, the people who are with me. No, that's not the point. So I think the government is set wrongly. The president should have filled up his own defi deficiencies. He has been out of government. He doesn't even understand the federal government as it works as a state governor, and even as a state governor, 50, over 18 years or 16 years uh, thereabout have passed since he exercised executive or even legislative power. So he is being a genius. He has become outdated. He needed to have people who are current, who understand how the federal government works. And you see that gap. It doesn't matter what those guys were 20 years ago in Lagos State. Not because of Leg Lagos, Metro Lagos will have the highest catchment of talents because of its commercial and metropolitan nature. That's given. But you have to move away from those people you were, if they, except they have been holding public offices and adapting to the shaping narrative and structure of governance. So I think the team is bad and he can start tweaking it, changing it, bringing people who understand, who understand the federal government and mix them up. Bring some of your people who don't understand but who are probably innovative and bring those who understand the lay of the land and you mix it up and you All get right. a better I, outcome. All right, Dr. Amadi, I'd like for us to conclude on our you know, main topic, which is this World Bank loan. Now that we have established that it is a loan and not a grant, I mean, it's a, they say it's a purpose for results. I mean, which I think is a great initiative. Now, should we... Now turn our attention to state governors, um, you know, to find out what it is that they have done with this loan. I mean, given that these monies that they have received them in batches and obviously they will have to be paying it back. How are they paying it back? What are the projects that they have done with these um, monies? And uh, the Nastara state governor had said that the loan was not a palliative in one breath. In another breath, he said that, you know, there was one program that was a cash transfer scheme program where he had to, you know, uh, give out two, two, I mean, 10,000 naira to about 2,000 people for a year. Should we turn our attention now to the state governors to find out what it is that these monies we have been, have been um, used for? I think we should, and I th thank you for making that point. Look, yes, federal government has failed in some ways, but we should move to the state. The states, is the, the states are the most important centers for development. The development from underdevelopment to development as we are today requires a rural economy that is strong, 
Look at agriculture, which is both a great, uh, you know, uh, you know, supplier of uh, jobs and also uh, improvement in terms of multidimensional poverty. It's at the state level that it works. Look at small and medium enterprises. The states should be the ones who create the soft infrastructure and hard infrastructure for that. So I think, irrespective of whether the federal government lied or not, it's time now to focus on the states. Yes, it's a loan, but let's see the project. By the way, the difference between palliatives or cash transfers and projects that are meant to address human development deficit is not too much. End of the day, they have to be reasonably designed, they have to be targeted, they have to be you know, prudent in, in, in financial intervention. So the states cannot cop out by saying, oh, these are projects uh, we have used for projects. No, let's audit the project, because if the projects are done well, in short to medium term, we will see impact on poverty level, we will see improvement in socioeconomic well-being. So there's no excuse for states, and I think at this juncture, maybe we should foreclose federal government for some time and get back to the states to make sure that, in fact, the states is actually the real gateway, I repeat again, to economic transformation for the Nigerian state. The federal government is plagued with several contradictions, electoral issues, the post at the federal level is much complex and anti-development. Maybe we see four or five states, you know, move out of this spiral of failure and they begin to signpost what is a, a real economic development looks like. And then they, they can actually go back and infect the federal government. The federal government change. So if the federal government is not working, let five, six states work very well. Let them symbolize economic transformation and then build up a pattern which can be borrowed in the state. We've seen that in history. We've seen in Italy, the Northern and Southern Italy, discrepancy in economic well-being arising from different social capital. We've seen in several places. So the states can actually thrive in spite of the federal government. And therefore, citizens of those states should not say because Tilbu is not delivering on what we want, therefore allow our government, governors to run riot. Let's now, you know, kind of calibrate our effort and put 60% on making the states governors sit up and deliver. Because if they do, we we'll see rapid rise in human development. And then 40% perhaps for the federal government because of its coordination capability and importance. Honestly, this is very, very sad for a president of a country coming on national television and lied to the whole nation. Like this is unacceptable. It is obvious now that Tunugu do not even know what is going on in his own government. Yes, my people. Like, thank you so much, Dr. Sam Ahmadi, for speaking truth to the power, for saying it as it is, because this government, they need to hear the truth. So that is it. As I make I bring this update so that you can know everything that is happening in our country called Nigeria, that on our president lied. At least three governors have already come out and said that they didn't receive any rice, no money, my people. Hey, <laughs> hey. So I would love you guys to leave your thoughts in the comment section. What do you think about what uh, Dr. Sam Amadi said here? Like the video and subscribe if today is your first time here. Yes, my people, I'm going to see you guys in my next update. Thanks so much for watching and goodbye for now. Welcome to Chamber Senior Steve.